Hi everyone and welcome to today's Credibility in Neuroscience webinar on uh, reporting research. Uh, my name is Joe Clift, I'm the Head of Policy and Campaigns at the British Neuroscience Association and uh, in my role I'm responsible for our work on the Credibility in Neuroscience campaign. Um, we are today going to be uh, uh, hearing from a number of different uh, speakers, including um, Johan Carlin, who will be talking about uh, one minute. We'll be talking about how statistical power influences expected reproducibility. Um, we'll also be hearing from uh, Guillaume Rousselet, uh talking about uh, registered reports. And lastly, from Professor Rick Henson uh, talking about pre-registration posters. And following those pre-recorded talks, there will be then a Q&A. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions through the uh, through the question tab provided through the uh, uh, GoToWebinar uh, platform. Um, what we'll do before that is I'd like to take this opportunity to talk through just a little bit of an introduction about the BNA and our credibility in neuroscience campaign. So just to begin, the BNA is a professional uh, membership organization. Uh, we have a sort of purpose to sort of uh, preserve and protect uh, health and advance public engagement in neuroscience. We do that through supporting, promoting, representing neuroscientists and neuroscience research. We have over 2,000 members with the largest UK organization representing all neuroscience um, across the field and uh, all stages of um, the career structure in, in neuroscience as well. Uh, and we're committed to advancing public engagement and sharing of neuroscience. To do this, so the, well, the memberships are really the core of our organization. We have a number of different membership categories. If you're new to the BNA today, uh, please consider joining us. And there are a number of different membership categories that might um, uh, fit your current sort of status. We also have a, uh, a national network across the UK of Ireland of local uh, neuroscience groups as well. Uh, and it would be, be great to have you involved in that uh, too. Um, we've got a lot of work coming up ahead of next year's um, uh, Festival of Neuroscience, so we're working currently towards that in April 2021. Uh, this we've just recently announced because of the uncertainty with COVID-19 will be an online uh, festival uh, and there's more information on the BNA website. Moving just to sort of give you an introduction on credibility in neuroscience. So this is one of our central focuses for the next five to 10 years at the BNA. And this is with a view to sort of ensuring a sustainable future for 21st century neuroscience research. Credibility might be a, a new term for you. And by this, we mean um, robust, reliable, replicable, and reproducible research. And an obvious question might be that um, uh, does, does our campaign mean that none of those things are being done at this very minute? And the answer to that is, is no, there's lots of excellent, valuable, and important research uh, out there. But that does come with a caveat, the caveat being um, that 85% of biomedical research efforts are currently wasted. Now those have um, a number of sort of important impacts on not just neuroscience, but also uh, society. So with the degree of waste that's going on, there's potentially um, a stall in progress with, uh, with science. There's impacts on um, the cost of uh, research in terms of uh, funds being wasted. Uh, and there can be also impacts on the future of uh, potential drug pipelines, but also on how society as a whole views, uh, views science as well. And there's a number of different factors affecting why some of these practices have, have uh, 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 arisen. And whilst I don't have time to go into all of those today, um, I'd just like to sort of focus on this one 
particular cartoons that, have, uh, that highlight some of how we've changed in terms of how scientists um, sort of uh, consider their work. So on the, uh, the left-hand side, you've got the 19th century scientist who believes that I must find the explanation for this phenomenon in order to truly understand nature. And on the 21st century scientist side, you've got uh, a view of, I must get the research that fits my narrative so that I can get my paper into nature. Uh, very much sort of, uh, sort of uh, highlighting the publish or perish um, uh, culture that seeped in. So the, lastly, the, the focus of um, the BNA's campaign. So this is really is rooted around our core messages as an organization of engaging, enabling, and influencing people. Um, and what we want to do in each of those three areas with regards to the credibility in neuroscience campaign is firstly support a shift in research culture that's welcomed across all areas of neuroscience. Um, we also want to enable people by equipping neuroscientists with the skills, knowledge, and tools that they need to actually help to embed those credibility practices into their own work. But they can't do this by themselves, and we have to be um, uh, sym uh, sympathetic as well to the overall broader environment that uh, neuroscientists work in. So that's where, um, in terms of influencing, we want to change the overall landscape with which um, neuroscientists currently operate. And we feel that by doing all of these uh, areas together, we'll be able to have the individual behavioral change, uh, the organizational institutional change, and the policy environmental change that we need to really make a difference in credibility in neuroscience as a whole. And for this, we're, uh, we're very much thankful for uh, the kind support of the Gatsby Foundation in doing this as well. So I'm now going to move on to the uh, three talks. So to begin with, we have uh, Johan Carlin, who's an investigator scientist at the MRC Cognition and Brain Science Unit at the University of Cambridge. And he is going to be doing his talk on how um, power affects reproducibility. Hi, everybody. My name is Johan Carlin. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how statistical power influences the reproducibility of our research. Um, so the take home message here is that, yes, power does matter for reproducibility. Even if we've done everything else to the best of our ability, even if we've been careful about the assumptions of our statistical model, even if we've been careful to avoid any questionable research practice like p-hacking or selective reporting, um, we can still have a problem with reproducibility by simple virtue of having low statistical power. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I'm going to unpack how that comes to be the case, and we'll see that that involves uh, this useful quantity known as a positive predictive value. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, I'll discuss how to do a power analysis correctly. So if you are going to try to do better, you're going to try and uh, estimate what sample size you need to have adequate power. Unfortunately, the sort of standard approaches to that problem tend to perpetuate low power rather than solve the problem. Um, so I'm going to argue for some slightly different solutions uh, for getting your effect size estimates. Um, before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of how this whole thing works. So in null hypothesis significance testing, we imagine this world where effects come from one of two distributions. Either the null is exactly true in the first column, in which case we expect to reject the null hypothesis anyway on alpha proportion of the cases. So that's the false positive rate, the thing we typically fix to 0.05. Um, alternatively, the null hypothesis is false and the effect is of some size, which I've denoted D here, in which case we can estimate this column, uh, and in particular the power of the design. So power is going to be 1 minus beta, where beta is the false negative rate, and that denotes out of all of the tests where this is true, where we have this particular effect, on what proportion of those tests do we indeed reject the null hypothesis. Um, the thing that's missing from this treatment 
is how to think about the statistical tests along the rows. So as experimenters, we tend not to know so much about what's going on here. What we have is a statistically significant test, which we'd like to know something about how likely is it that that's a false positive as opposed to a true positive. Um, so there's a common fallacy here in interpreting p-values to think that the p-value indicates how likely it is that you have a false positive. But that's not quite true. Um, similarly, when the test is non-significant, uh, we can't in general assume that that means there's no effect because there could also be false negatives. So how can we do better? Well, the thing that's missing here are the marginal probabilities. That is, out of all of the hypotheses we test, whether we reject or don't reject the null hypothesis, how many of those tests is there really an effect as opposed to null being true? We can call that the effect prevalence rate and just put that on the range of zero to one, where zero means that the null hypothesis is always true and one means that there's always an effect. Um, and once we do that, we can calculate um, the positive predictive value as the proportion out of all of the reported significant tests that are actually true positives. Um, so this term, the positive predictive value, comes from clinical medicine uh, and it was popularized by a medic, John Ioannidis, uh, who wrote this paper uh, in 2005 with a slightly bombastic title. Um, but the mathematical basis for what the title claim is about is really just a positive predictive value calculation. So it's saying that if we suppose that statistical power in a literature is low, power is one minus beta here in the formula, and the true effect prevalence rate is also low, that is, we are doing high-risk research, then it's, pos then it's likely that the PPV will come out to being less than 0.5, which means that when we do reject the null hypothesis, it's actually more likely that it's a false positive than a real discovery. Um, so that seems problematic, right? Um, we can do the same thing for the remainder of the hypothesis testing table I just showed you. Um, so we can calculate the negative predictive value as the proportion out of the reported non-significant tests that are actually true negatives. Um, and the thing to appreciate from these formulas is um, I don't have time to unpack them for you. They're relatively easy to understand if you want to have a go in your own time. Um, but the thing to appreciate is that the same terms, beta, the false negative rate, alpha, the false positive rate, and the effect prevalence rate, these terms feature in both formulas. So we can already see that statistical power, in particular, one minus beta, is going to be important for the reproducibility of both our significant results and our non-significant results. Um, so to make that a little bit more concrete, I'm going to work through uh, two simple example scenarios. So let's suppose that we're in uh, sort of the best of all worlds for null hypothesis significance testing. Uh, we're doing reasonably risky research, so the effect prevalence rate is 25%. Um, that's the purple part of the pie chart. And when the null hypothesis falls, we have 80% power. So we generally can reject the null when it is false. In that case, the positive predictive value is simply going to be the proportion of dark shaded area, that is p less than 0.05 cases, that falls under H1, so when the null is false. And we can see that about 80% of that area is going to come from here, that's the positive predictive value. Similarly, the negative predictive value is just going to be the light shaded area, so the cases where we do not reject the null. How likely is it that they come from the null is true part of the pie? It's quite likely in this case. So here the null hypothesis significance testing approach is performing very nicely. We make reasonable decisions. Um, but what if power is actually low? Let's suppose power is about 20%, which is what Kate Button famously argued might be plausible for neuroscience, um, well then both the positive and the negative predictive value goes down. Um, and we can see intuitively why that happens from the pie chart, right? So you can see that now the power has gone down, so we are less able to reject the null when it's false. Um, and in fact, it's going to be difficult now to distinguish a significant test under H1 from H0, though they're about equally frequent, right? It's going to be a toss-up whether a significant test is a true positive or false positive. Similarly, on the negative side, we now have all these false negatives that sort of make it less ambiguous, less clear uh, whether a negative result really indicates that there's nothing there to discover. Um, 
So I think this later case of the negative predictive value, that's what everyone thinks of when they think about statistical power. They think that if you have low power, that might mean that you have to worry about false negatives. But I hope that this treatment shows you that actually low power is a problem for your statistically significant results as well. Um, you should have just as little faith in those as you do in your statistically non-significant results if you suspect that power is low. Um, so that's the problem. Now what's how can we solve this? Well, we want to do a power analysis. It's generally quite straightforward to do. There's common, you know, free software out there to do it. Um, and the problem you'll encounter when you start plugging in values and get doing the calculation is that you'll be asked to supply an effect size estimate, um, typically a Cohen's D or a partial eta squared value. And it can be a little difficult to come up with those values because um, here is the chicken and egg problem, right? If we knew exactly how big the effect was, why are we doing another experiment? Um, generally, we do experiments to learn about the world. Um, it's unlikely that we'd be doing a study if we knew ex that there was an effect and furthermore, we knew exactly how big it was. Um, so what can we do then? How can we sort of make some headway here anyway, even in the face of this uncertainty? Um, let's evaluate a few sort of approaches to this problem, some of which will turn out to work better than others. So the most obvious thing to try and the thing that you see recommended quite often is to do a pilot study. So let's collect a few participants of the exact experiment we want to do um, and let's see what kind of effect size we get and then we can power the full study according to that effect size estimate. It seems quite reasonable, right? Um, I'm going to argue that that's a bad idea. Um, so let's understand why with a little numerical simulation. Um, in this simulation uh, we're simulating a paired t-test or one sample t-test design. So we're comparing two related means within samples um, and in all cases, so we've done 5,000 simulations of this, in each simulation we have six participants, uh, so sort of typical pilot data set. Um, and in each case, the real effect that we're studying is as a Cohen's D of 0.5. So that's always given. There are no cases here where the null hypothesis is true. We're only simulating H1. Um, but due to sampling error, we'll have a different estimate depending on or where which situation we run. We're going to be, in fact, we're going to be all over the place. So if you appreciate that Cohen's D is in units of standard deviation, you can see that although we're centered on the real effect, we can end up with an effect that's quite far from the real value. In fact, you can end up with an effect over here that's less than zero, so a difference that goes in the opposite of the true direction. Over here, you can get an effect that's greater than one. Cohen's D of greater than one is rare in cognitive studies, I would say. Um, but what does that mean? What does it mean if we have a pilot with a d-estimate that's a bit variable? Um, what does that, how does that pose a problem for our um, pilot power design in practice? Well, to make that more concrete, let's take these d-estimates and convert them to sample size requirements. So suppose that you have done one of these pilots, you've gotten an effect size estimate, and now you calculate what sample size do I need for 80% power in my full study. The distribution you get for that is long tailed. So I've capped it here at 100 participants, it goes into the thousands. So as the effect size becomes very small, you tend to need increasingly vast sample sizes. Um, on that part of the distribution, you might just give up, right? If your pilot shows you a tiny effect, you might never attempt the full study. Um, at the other end, um, the modal value, the typical sort of effect you see, is severely underpowered. It's an end of a seven or eight. Uh, when the correct answer, if you will, in this case, is an n of 34. So with a real effect of 0.5, you should really be having, an, your estimate should be around here. This is how many participants you need. Um, and in fact, this is about the median of this long tail distribution. So 50% of the time, you'll be overpowered. And in fact, you might come up with a sample size that's so big that you'll never try the real study. And on the remaining 50% of the cases, when you're below the median, uh, you're going to typically end up with a sample size that is severely underpowered for the real effect. So I would argue that this is just too variable. Um, you're, with these small sample sizes, estimating a quantity like a standardized effect size is just a little bit hopeless. You're quite likely to come up with an effect size that's just way off base from the real effect. Um, and your study will be over before it started effectively because you just gotten the power analysis so badly wrong. Um, 
So what can we do instead? Well, the problem is that we don't have enough participants in the pilot, right, to have a reasonable estimate of the effect size. So well, suppose that we got the effect size from a previous study instead, then we might have a bit more data to play with, right? Um, so here in the bottom panel, I've repeated the simulation using 20 participants in each iteration, which is sort of plausible enough value for our cognitive neuroscience type research. Um, so now we have slightly better power for the population effect size, although it's not perfect. I don't think it's realistic to simulate the case where we actually have 80% power, because I, I suspect that's rarely the case. Um, so you can see that the effect of having more participants on each iteration of the simulation is to shrink the variability of the Cohen's D. Right? You're now getting an estimate that's more tightly centered on the true value, 0.5. Um, the problem is, when you power according to a previous study or a previous publication, uh, you're only likely to be doing that when that study had a statistically significant result. Right? So in practice, the, if we color these graphs according to statistical significance, I think it's fair to assume that the blue guys are either going to be sitting in your file drawer or certainly are not going to be followed up with a new study. The orange part of the graph is the one where you might actually attempt to do a power calculation for a new study. And you can see from this that by only sampling from this part of the distribution, you're going to introduce a positive bias. You're going to have an overestimate of the true effect size. Um, so if we take these estimates and we convert them to sample size requirements again, you can see that the effect of that is to basically restrict you to cases, to sample sizes rather, which are underpowered. So again, the correct answer in all these simulations is an N of 34. Um, and in almost every case, even with a larger previous sample size, you're almost guaranteed to come up with a sample size requirement that's underpowered for the real effect. Um, so that's not really solving the problem either. And you can actually see this sort of curious dependence of the sample size um, of the original studies on what you get out after you apply this kind of significance filtering. So if we look at the median sample size requirement for only the significant cases, it's 21 when the n of 20 is 20 for the original studies, and it's 7 when the original studies that go into the calculation have an n of 6. Um, so it's sort of like these, when you only look at the significant cases, you tend to learn more about what sample size the previous studies had than what sample size you actually need for 80% power for the real ground truth effect. So that's what I mean by uh, perpetuating low statistical power. You tend to, if you have low power already in the literature you're studying, it's hard to get out of it by these sort of naive applications of power analysis. Um, so I don't like either of these approaches in general, uh, and that's a little controversial because this is what almost everyone is doing at the moment. Um, how can we do better? Well, um, I think the way forward is really going to be to look at large consortium studies. Um, these consortium data sets have two benefits. One, uh, the estimates of effect are going to be much better because they have much bigger sample sizes, and two, there's less bias because there's no significance filter here. So. The best example of this comes from um, Joe Kedernis and colleagues in this beautiful uh, review article that I recommend reading. Um, so I could talk about this figure all day long, but I'm going to try to be stay on target here. Um, so what's being plotted here are Cohen's D estimates. This is also a paired T test design. So this is exactly the same kind of quantity that we plotted in the previous simulations. Um, and here the violent plots are the distribution over voxels in a group level analysis. Um, so each violin plot shows the effect in a particular region of interest, which is independently selected with neurosynth, uh, and for a particular contrast. So there's a range of cognitive neuroscience contrasts being reported and a range of regions that span much of the brain except visual cortex. Um, and all the same, you can see that the effect size estimates are kind of comparable, right? Um, it's rare that you see an effect size that's less than a Cohen's D of 0.2, what Cohen denoted a small effect. So that's good news in a way. The null hypothesis seems to be false in all of these cases. It's reassuring if you're very cynical about fMRI. Um, but on the other hand, the, if none of these have a median effect size, that's the black dot, that reaches what Cohen would define as a large effect. So the task fMRI effects seem to sit in this sort of 0.3 to 0.7 range. 
Um, so one thing you could do then for your task from my study, if you have a within subjects design, would be to say, well, let's find the HCP contrast that's most like my experiment, accepting that it's going to be a little bit different from what you actually want to do. Um, let's find a region with neurosynth and let's calculate what effect size we get there. Um, and the gain there in the precision of that estimate and the absence of bias is so large that I will argue that it outweighs the loss in validity, if you will, from considering an effect that's actually rather different from what you wanted to study. Um, the final thing that you could do, my final recommendation would be that to say that, well, the other way to go on this is to say that, well, all of these estimates are actually kind of similar in magnitude. So maybe it's not unreasonable to set your effect size by convention for the entire field to say that, well, okay, task F and I with a within subject design, it looks like a Cohen's D of about 0.5 is not an unreasonable starting point in the absence of strong evidence to the contrary. Um, so you could just say, well, all studies that we run should be powered at least at that level. And I think on average, you'd be less wrong doing that than doing these sort of noisy pilot studies. Uh, and certainly you're less likely to be underpowered than if you look only at previous published, probably statistically significant effects. Um, so let's wrap up. So I hope to have convinced you that statistical power limits the reproducibility of positive and negative results. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, then at least take on board that you cannot trust your statistically significant results if you suspect low power. Um, it's not the case that power is only relevant when you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, and the second part of the talk was all about getting a reasonable effect size estimate. I think consortium studies is your best hope here. Um, don't fall into the trap of only looking at published studies because you'll get back the same sample size that you put in and that you're not really learning anything from that. So I'm going to close on some resources. I want to especially point you to my website where I have Jupyter notebooks that generate all of the figures and simulations I talked about today. Uh, feel free to download those and try your hand. I think this is a really good way to so gain some familiarity with these concepts. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. I'm Guillaume Rousselet. I'm editor at uh, two society neuroscience journals, the EGN and the BNA. And today, as part of the Credibility in Neuroscience campaign, I'm going to tell you about registered reports, which is a specific format of journal articles. I'm going to tell you what the format is, how it works, uh, and what that format aims to achieve. Don't worry about writing down the, the links that I provide in some of the slides, because the slide will be provided online. There'll be a link to a PDF version, so you can get that from there. So if you want to read more about the history of registered reports, you can read these recent articles from uh, Chris Chambers, published in the uh, Statistical Journal of Significance. Chris Chambers, a champion of registered reports, has been really um, over the last 10 years, developing that format and pushing it to uh, all stakeholders including publishers and editors to try to adopt uh, that format. So it's a really interesting read in uh, uh, that particular journey. So if you want to, to learn about registered reports, uh, whether you're uh, a scientist, uh, a author's researcher, or a reviewer or an editor, or even a publisher, thinking of implementing registered reports at their, uh, at their journal, you can find plenty of resources on the uh, Center for Open Science website. There's plenty of really useful resources, including a checklist. So if you have um, a study that's ready to run and you're thinking, well, maybe I'd like, you'd like to get feedback before you're in the study and you'd like to try a registered report, you can go through the checklist, populate the different fields, and quickly you'll have the first draft of a registered report. So it's a very good way to start. So what's, what are registered reports? So to, to describe the format, the best way is to start with what happens with a classic standard, ex, standard um, experiment and uh, journal article. So what you have is you, you stage one, you're going uh, plan your study, then you're going to run your experiment, write your report, your uh, journal article, which you, you submit, and you get feedback on that. You, may, you might go through an iterative process and pretty everybody's happy and the paper is accepted and finally published. Obviously, you don't need to wait that stage to get 
your article or your results uh, published or getting some uh, public attention, you can post a preprint, which I strongly recommend, um, or you can start blogging about your results and mention them on Twitter and other social media platforms, for instance. But typically, what happens is that you, uh, when you submit your article, you're getting feedback at a stage where most things in your experiment cannot be changed. You cannot change the experimental design anymore. You cannot change most of the time the, uh, the sample size. You clearly cannot change the way the, the data were sampled as, and many other aspects that, that cannot, be, cannot be changed. So typically the feedback is on the way the data were analyzed and the interpretation of the results. So it's quite limited. So it'd be really nice if we had a way to get feedback on studies before they even run. So to make the most out of our resources and the time we have available. And that format is what is offered by registered reports. So in registered reports, you plan your study and then you immediately write your report, which you submit to a journal and you're getting feedback on all the steps, including the hypothesis, the, 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 the quality of the hypothesis, is that, is that a useful question to ask? Does it fit with the literature about the methods, about how you're gonna go about sampling your data? What's the experimental paradigm? How do you plan to analyze the data and how everything fits together? So you're getting feedback at a stage where it really matters the most. And in that first stage, it's called stage one peer review. Once, once you've been through that, you can uh, get acceptance in principle. So that means your paper is accepted, provided that you run the study as you've described it, you analyze the, the data as you've described it, and you go ahead, you run your experiment, and then you write the last bit of uh, your article. So you might change the tense of your introduction. So maybe it was written in a future tense um, for stage one, for stage two, you're going to write that in a present or past tense. You'll have your method section, which will be essentially unchanged. And then you'll have the results and the discussion. And providing that you've, you've um, done everything as you said you would do. Um, of course, you can have some minor changes that you can document um, and that the discussion makes sense given the results, your paper is accepted. And pretty much, um, pretty much all papers that are accepted in that stage get a final acceptance. And that's a stage two peer review. And then your, your paper is accepted, but the beauty of it is that it's not only you're getting feedback early on, it's also that your paper is accepted no matter what the results are. So if you have some dreaded negative results where the data you collected do not support your hypothesis, well, it doesn't matter, it gets published anyway and everybody gets to see that. So we all learn uh, from those negative results which usually don't tend to be published. So why do we need registered reports? Well, we need them to combat specific problems in the scientific enterprise and in particular, um, certain types of question, well known as questionable research practices, which I described in this diagram. So here you have the cycle going through generating hypothesis, designing an experiment up to publishing the results. And you have particular questionable research practices described here in those boxes uh, with an indication of prevalence. So you've got lack of uh, replication being published, low statistical power in lots of programs of research, harking, which is generating hypotheses after the, the results are, are known, p-harking, also known as uh, cherry-picking, data dredging, and publish, publication bias towards positive results where the majority um, of, of um, articles, uh, clearly in neuroscience and psychology report, uh, positive results and lack of data sharing. And uh, registered reports address all of these uh, problems. Uh, if you want to read more about all this, this sort of problems and how they can lead to false positive in the literature, this is a very good uh, summary article that goes through 
all these types of problems, what the consequences are and uh, how we can do a better job. So what are the advantages of registered reports? Well, clearly they help combat pollution by cognitive biases. So they help getting rid of all this tendency to favor positive results um, and all the other problems described in the previous diagram. Um, so you can publish your study no matter how the results turn up. Isn't that amazing? So if you get a negative result, well, don't despair. If it's a registered report, it gets published anyway and you get credit for that and other people will learn that, well, maybe some, um, some experimental designs do not work, some hypotheses are maybe not worth investigating and so on. And there's a, a perspective for a PhD student described in this article here, for instance, describing part that, that, um, that situation where she, she was really sad that uh, she was, uh, hypothesis was not supported, but still she could get the stuff published because it was a registered report. The, your, your new and planned analysis um, that maybe you thought after the fact, uh, after seeing the results, can still be presented, but they describe as what they are, exploratory. I'll go back to the distinction uh, between the plan and the unplanned analysis uh, in, a, in the next slide. The reviewers and editors cannot force you to write a postdoc story because that happens a lot. Um, people are not happy because you don't have a very clean narrative. Uh, your story is a bit uh, bumpy. So they try to make you make your story align with the results. Well, you don't need to do that anymore in a register report. You can tell the story how it is because the story was written before you actually collected the data. So you can change it afterwards. And very importantly, get feedback when it matters most before you conduct your experiment so that you can make the most of the out of your resources and your time. And it's probably registered reports are just the, the best way to publish replication studies. It's extremely difficult to publish replication studies. There seems to be a bias towards uh, the original experiment. Um, so if you wanna if you wanna try to replicate something, go for a digital report because once it's accepted, then no matter what, how it turns up, whether you support the original study or not, it doesn't matter. It will get published. So our registered report being adopted, yes, it's a very uh, popular format. It's growing. Uh, there's um, at this stage 259 journals. We use that as a regular uh, option or as part of a single issue. It's doing what it's supposed to do. So here is an example of there's some early indication that, for instance, it's reducing bias. So there's two studies, one looking at um, registered reports and traditional uh, uh, journal articles across a range of disciplines and here specifically for psychology uh, and you can see the proportion of new findings report, reported in, in these types of articles and you can see uh, a huge difference here where the majority so the traditional articles are down there where the new findings are um, between 10 and 20 percent so uh, very, very low uh, number of negative studies being reported, whereas uh, the majority of registered reports uh, describe ne negative results. So there could be some bias there. It could be that people going for registered reports um, are, are going for um, hypotheses that are probably not true. It could, could, could be the case, but still uh, what matters is that that stuff gets published anyway. So we, we're learning from that where otherwise it's really hard to publish. Um, and it's the same story here, specifically looking at the psychology literature where you see uh, registered reports with um, a big number of, uh, here they're looking at just specifically the first hypothesis described in a paper, was it, was it supported by the data or not? Uh, uh, you can see a large number of negative outcomes, whereas there's a tiny fraction in the in standard reports. So there's clearly something going on with uh, standard reports. If you uh, have questions uh, about registered reports, there's a fantastic uh, uh, FAQ uh, on the uh, COS website uh, looking at 
plenty of uh, different types of questions and addressing a lot of misconceptions. So strongly encourage you to go through that. Um, one of the one of the the criticism that uh, you often hear is that uh, registered reports would be a creativity killer. It would stop you from exploring your data the way you'd want, but it's uh, actually not the case at all. Um, in a registered report, then the main thing is that your results section is divided into two parts. You have the confirmatory analysis, where you have your test of a hypothesis, your it's called inferential statistics, and that's the test you've described in your registered report before you collected the data. But you, nothing is stopping you from exploring your data. So you can have a second section in your registered report describing exploratory analysis, maybe afterwards, after your paper was accepted. Um, in stage one review, you had new ideas of analysis to do, or maybe you you started to generate new hypotheses after seeing after seeing the results and you want to have a go at your data and see um, if there's some trends there that could be interesting. So that's your exploratory analysis for which you should not report inferential statistics because your intention were not declared ahead of time. So you really have these two sections. So creativity is not affected, go right, but you have to clearly declare in two different sections which were the tests, the hypothesis you wanted to test from the start and what came afterwards. And that distinction is really important. It's been described a while ago. There's a, a very good paper from Adrianus de Groot from 1956, uh, originally published in uh, Dutch, but it's been translated recently. And um, he, he described the need for uh, a distinction between confirmatory and exploratory analysis and the need to pre-register your intentions to really tease apart the two uh, different types of analysis. So if you want to read more about what's coming next for registered report, because that's not the end of the story, there's a great article from Chris Chambers describing new exciting developments and how the formats can be made even better. Um, but to broaden the scope a bit, here I'd like to stop and um, just um, put some quotes uh, that I find uh, really good. They, they're a bit long to uh, get a tattoo, but uh, they're definitely worth putting up on your wall because whether you go for registered reports or not, um, it's, it, those are words worth keeping in mind. So here Andrew Gelman tells us, forget about getting definitive results from a single experiment. Instead, embrace variation, accept uncertainty, and learn what you can. And finally, this one from Richard Moore, we said, discovery of a new effect is a matter for a research program, not a single experiment. There is no statistical criterion that can establish a discovery. And if you want to know what's going on with the dog here, you have to read this excellent blog post by Richard Moray. So thank you very much. And that's it for me. Hi, my name is Rick Henson, and I'm going to talk about pre registration posters. And these are the brainchild of my colleague, Ronnie Tebon, at the MRC CBU in Cambridge. So the next uh, 10 minutes, I'd like to uh, go through four things. Firstly, the, the background to this idea of pre-reg posters. And I'll talk about the theoretical advantages of such posters, and then show you um, some evidence from a survey for the popularity of these posters. And finally, uh, future considerations for conferences that might adopt this poster format. So the background to this uh, uh, was when Ronnie and I were uh, thinking about submitting an abstract to present a poster at a conference. And uh, typically the conference rules say that the abstracts must describe uh, completed work. Uh, and yet the deadline for abstract submission is often several months before the conference itself. And as a consequence, uh, when you come to presenting the poster at the conference, either the work in the poster is already published or available as a preprint, in which case it's, it's not really news anymore, or the results in the poster have changed 
from those described in the uh, abstract in the conference proceedings. Because the authors have been rushed to submit an abstract and therefore submitted only preliminary or uh, incomplete analyses. And as a consequence, this is how Ronnie felt. So our solution was to allow uh, a format of posters, which we call pre-reg posters, that present planned work uh, before data have been collected, or at least before data have been analysed. And some of the advantages of this format are, I think the main advantage is the ability to get feedback from uh, conference delegates who are presumably experts in your area as well, that allow you to improve the design of your study or modify the hypotheses or uh, optimize the analyses before you collect the data. It also allows you to gain potential collaborators from the conference, people who have a shared interest and may want to help uh, actually run the study. At the other extreme, you may uh, get feedback that leads you to decide to scrap the study. If there was insufficient interest at the conference or a fatal flaw in the whole approach, and therefore at least you haven't wasted time collecting the data. And finally, you can uh, publicize the precedence of an idea for a study. Um, you have a record in the conference proceedings, and this is particularly uh, uh, helpful when you can uh, log your abstract on a publicly uh, accessible website, such as the Open Science Foundation, the OSF website, or conduct a proper pre-registration on that website. And so we uh, published this idea in a paper in 2018 in Trends in Cognitive Sciences. And you can uh, read the paper on this link at the bottom of the screen, if you wish. And I think pre-reg posters are another way to improve the credibility of science. Um, to step back for a moment, uh, you're probably familiar with the concept of registered reports. Uh, and these are publications that are reviewed and once the, uh, they pass the review, uh, the design and methods are locked, uh, and then the data can therefore uh, can only then be collected. And this uh, prevents uh, the biases that we all suffer from, such as hypothesizing after results are known, or harking, or p-hacking, etc. There's also the option to pre-register a study on a website, um, such as the OSF website, which are uh, not often reviewed uh, and may or may not be locked. And of course, this is as stringent as a registered report, uh, but I think it's still uh, helpful to do. We do this routinely in our group um, because I know that it enforces more careful thought about the design and the analysis before you collect data, because you are uh, at least um, publicly stating what you're going to do and can be checked. I'm aware that uh, in some cases, publications have been compared against pre-registration on a website and differences found, but uh, so it's not perfect, but I still think it is good for encouraging more careful thought uh, than happens when we typically rush into the next experiment. And then pre-reg posters, uh, they, where do they fall in this landscape? Well, they uh, may be reviewed by the conference organizers, but it's important they are not locked. And that's why we call them pre-registration posters, before registration. So we're not saying that you, when you present a poster that you are uh, committing yourself to following the design and methods in that poster precisely when you come to analyze or, or collect the data. Uh, rather, we see this as a step prior to registration where you can get feedback from your colleagues and uh, the opportunity to, to modify or improve your design before you then go on to register properly uh, for example, as a registered report. Uh, so that's where we see these uh, pre-reg posters fitting into a more credible science. Um, so we allowed pre-reg posters at the BNA Festival of Neuroscience uh, in Dublin last year. And it was pleasing that over a fifth of posters were this new format of pre-reg posters, despite the very early adoption of this idea. And we did a survey uh, both before and after the conference. Uh, if you want to read the survey or look at the questions, the link is here. And we published a paper uh, summarizing and doing a qualitative analysis of that survey um, 
in this uh, paper here. Again, the link is on the screen if you want to read in more detail. Uh, and we did various, as I said, qualitative analyses. Um, and I just want to pick out a few highlights from that paper. Uh, first, there was no evidence that pre-reg posters were less popular or less visited, or people found them less interesting than more traditional posters uh, that describe completed studies. Uh, as expected, most feedback that the presenters of pre-reg posters received was about the methods and the design. Um, but what was interesting is that most of the feedback for presenters of traditional posters was not about the data themselves, but about the future studies we could do. And that just shows that delegates are interested in coming up with new and alternative ideas for methodology and future studies. So they're almost doing this uh, process already of helping researchers with uh, future designs. Finally, um, there was some suggestion in the data that pre-reg posters were more common from early career researchers. Uh, there may be many reasons for this, two of which are that uh, generally uh, young researchers are more keen to adopt uh, recent initiatives such as registration and ideas in open science. Uh, another reason is that um, often young researchers need to have proof that an abstract has been accepted in order to obtain the funding to travel to a conference. Uh, but by allowing them to uh, submit abstracts with uh, carefully thought out studies, uh, they, which are then accepted, they can therefore attend conferences more easily, we hope, at least when they occur in reality. Uh, finally, uh, some thoughts about future adoption of pre-reg, uh, which we'd like to see nearly all conferences offer. Um, so far, we're aware of at least five conferences that have allowed this format. Uh, which we think is great. Um, if uh, a conference does consider them, we think it's very important that the reviewers of abstracts are made aware of the principles of pre-reg posters. Otherwise, the danger, there is a danger that they will score them less highly than traditional posters because they don't have any data. So it's important that reviewers are aware of the, the um, principles of these, this poster format. Uh, we think it's important to highlight uh, in the, uh, the proceedings and in the, the posters themselves, uh, which type of poster, whether it's a pre-reg poster or a, uh, data, a poster with data, uh, possibly with badges. And if you want to read more about uh, the BNA's experience with uh, pre-reg posters and some other thoughts, then again, here's another link that you can follow up uh, in your own time. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick, for that. Um, I'm now going to ask the other panelists to um, join me, switch on your webcams, and uh, prepare for some questions. And just to make sure that everybody's unmuted as well, um, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, those were three really sort of interesting talks in, in uh, highlighting sort of some of the factors that are important in, in sort of the reporting issues around um, reproducibility and also sort of thinking about some of the um, some of the sort of innovations that are coming up. Um, uh, I was just wondering if, if um, uh, there's sort of one thing that, that either of, uh, that any of you sort of think is the key thing to address in, in any of those particular areas. If, um, uh, uh, Johan, uh, do you want to start off? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's there's a lot of work to be done. I think for me personally, I think pre-registration is probably the one thing that promises to make the biggest difference for the field. I think that has the potential to solve many of the other problems. If we had a more, if we had less biased estimates of the effects that are actually there, then uh, we could we could do much to. For instance, I think the issue about power would become less, you know, it would become less of a debatable issue if we knew what size the effects are, then it would be relatively straightforward to say whether we have a power problem or not, which currently it's kind of a debatable point because the published effects are very large. So if you believe them, then you could argue that there's no problem, right? 
them. We've had um, a question through on um, pre-registration posters. Uh, uh, perhaps, Rick, if you're able to um, uh, answer this one. So um, uh, this person is very excited by the idea, but has a supervisor who's very afraid that people might steal their research ideas. Um, how can she convince her uh, that the benefits will outweigh the risk? That's a good question. Um, I wonder whether the fear of being scooped is actually a paper tiger in many fields. It may not be the case in this, in your, the, the questioner's particular field. It may be that there are a lot, large number of labs doing very similar work. But just to start with, I think the fear of being scooped is actually um, uh, unrealistic mainly. And there's a good blog post about cases where people have been scooped and it's actually very rare. But anyway, to address the uh, question, the idea is that if the pre-edge poster is, appears in a conference proceedings, then it is one way at least to prove precedence for the idea that you had planned this, even if someone comes along later and does the experiment. But of course, that would be combined with um, not only presenting the poster at a conference, but then uh, putting a pre-edge up on a website, um, such as the OSF website as well, to again, to claim that this idea um, uh, had came earlier than some other study that was later published. Um, but I appreciate that it is tricky and some people are very concerned about being uh, beaten uh, in this race. Um, uh, but I would try and convince your supervisor that actually the probability is low and this is actually one way to, to stamp some a timestamp on your, your idea. Thank you for that. Um... Are there any questions that I, uh, any of the panelists had for any of the existing error, um, other areas that were covered in this? So I'm um, very happy for, for uh, to give each of you an opportunity to ask the other a question. I think Johan's already made the, the point that uh, these talks are related, or certainly register reports uh, can potentially address the problem that Johan raised of this perpetuation of low powered studies because effect, size are, effect sizes are overestimated due to publication bias. So if people published everything, uh, and of course you have to publish in a registered report, then we would get more accurate estimates of effect sizes. Um, so uh, registered reports are one way to solve this. The other way is just to publish all data everywhere um, so that uh, one can pull across lots of different uh, data sets to get a more accurate estimate of effect size. Um, uh, I was going to ask Johan, um, his uh, talk is predicated on what's called the null hypothesis significance testing framework, uh, where false positive rates and power have a particular meaning. There are uh, other statistical approaches such as Bayesian statistics, in particular calculating a Bayes factor for uh, the null hypothesis relative to your alternative hypothesis, um, which might be another um, solution to this problem, or at least um, in those frameworks or those approaches, you can continue testing until you get enough evidence for uh, one hypothesis or the other. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on Bayesian approaches. Um, not in detail. I guess I have two points on that. One is, yes, I, I agree that base factors can be preferable in some ways if you're doing hypothesis testing, uh, but I think perhaps one more general um, issue here is that we we are a little bit over obsessed with hypothesis testing and testing specific qualitative ideas and that always I think runs the risk of introducing these sort of selection bias effects uh, I think if we could emphasize estimation of effects over testing specific point hypotheses we'd be better off and once you're doing estimation then of course Bayesian stuff is good for that too right but um, but I think the, the I think the issue really is um, we are a little bit as a field, at least in cognitive neuroscience, I think we're slightly over obsessed with this idea of testing a specific hypothesis rather than trying to estimate. Yeah, so so probably part of the answer would be to uh, well, it's the foot of journals and editorial boards to a large extent is the is the expectation from the community that we have to test hypotheses. I think if we had plenty, if it was largely accepted that we can do exploratory research and it's perfectly a valid way to proceed, then people would chill and stop 
trying to stick hypotheses where they've just really is just an exploration and a lot of those problems would go away so uh, th then you wouldn't have these debates with power and so on people would just publish what they have because they would say well, well that's just an exploratory study which is you know at least 90 percent of what is published in your science is just exploratory just at the end people add some p-values to make it look more sciencey but it's um it's um really defeats the purpose of the scientific enterprise we're here to quantify effects and we don't necessarily need to test specific hypotheses or point hypotheses like John was mentioning. I agree with you, but humans are very bad at uh, dealing with you know posterior probability distributions or effect sizes as a continuous property and they like to have black or white answers that the hypothesis is true or not. I, I know we can't give them a black recently about p values to be honest. Yeah. But um, I think that's just the way a lot of scientists think, is, is this hypothesis true or not? And I know that we cannot give them the answer definitively with statistics, but uh, they want to see a binary outcome rather as opposed to a some uh, distribution of likely effect sizes for each parameter. Mm. Well, that's what is great about the Bayesian. Another... You focus on your posterior distributions and then you realize, well, there's a range of values that are compatible with um, with my model and my data. Um, but that's the case too with uh, frequency statistics. You can you can you can have this sort of description as well if you if you if you're willing to embrace uncertainty. One thing you can do, for instance, if you use frequency statistics, but if you use method like the bootstrap, for instance, you can show your entire bootstrap distribution. You, so you can say that's that's my estimate, but this is the variability that I expect in the population. And if you if people were willing to show this sort of distribution in their papers people will start to think, well, actually, it's not just one value, it's a range of plausible values. And then we could have more meaningful discussions that would go beyond just black and white, yes, no, significant, not significant. So that's that's one way to make the debate um, a bit um, a bit more interesting. Um, one step, one thing I encourage people to do when I review or edit papers is to to use rich graphical description of the data to start with because even if they use whatever method they use afterwards they can just say black and white yes my hypothesis is supported or not because then you can go to the graph and say well actually your data are compatible with this range here you have plenty of individual differences so we can have a bit more nuanced discussions so i think that's simple steps like that, that can be implemented We've had a couple of um, uh, comments that have come in on. Um, uh, so to begin, the sort of idea that um, uh, research doesn't need to be governed by a hypothesis if it's exploratory, and the other um, sort of idea around sort of exploratory reports as a means of uh, complementing uh, registered reports. Do I, um, any of you have any views on those particular things? I would love to uh, create exploratory reports on a lot of journals. I mean, I've been in discussion at EGN, for instance, to introduce exploratory reports. Because I, I strongly believe in that. I'd be happy to publish mostly exploratory reports. I have absolutely no shame in saying that I've done a lot of experiments where we had a vague hypothesis, but the main thing we wanted to know is how strong are the effects because there's plenty of experiments where you know there are effects um, what you don't know is the, the details how big they are how do they co-vary with other variables you might want to measure and you just want to explore your data set and have fun and that's perfectly fine so i think we should push for that we should have exploratory report as a journal format um, to complement registered reports and they achieve very different goals. But with good exploratory research, you can generate strong hypotheses that then could lead to something that you want to formalize and bring to formal hypothesis testing where you've discovered something that looks really, really interesting and it's worth um, spending the time to do a pre-registration and so on. But for most research, I think exploratory reports would be the way to go. You don't need to add any p-values to do solid research. 
I mean, if you look at in our in our fields, you know, in neuroscience, you look at the works of people like Hubert and Wiesel, all their papers uh, leading to the Nobel Prize have absolutely zero p-value. There's not there's no stats in their papers mm. at all. They didn't care. They did very careful description based on hours and hours spent in the lab, and they made massive discoveries. But from that, they generated very specific hypotheses because they developed those models uh, that then led to decades of research where people had much more specific hypotheses to test. Would anybody else like to come in on exploratory reports? I think Guillermo has answered it well. Excellent. I mean, I, I could ask another question, which is a practical issue about registered reports on um, hypothesis-driven papers. Um, a practical problem is that when we've tried to do this ourselves, particularly with young PhD students, because it can take many months for the review to come through before data can start being collected, this can uh, cause issues for people who have a, you know, a limited time or three years or four years to do their PhD. It delays them collecting data. Um, so I, I fully appreciate that the British reports are the right thing to do, but I'm just pointing out in time constraints, for example, with the COVID situation, when there's many, excuse the dog in the background, when there are many um, situations where we need a rapid answer, uh, peer review can take a long time. Uh, so I was just wondering if there are any thoughts about how we can, uh, when time is of essence, uh, I suppose we could just do a, a registered a peer association on a website without peer review. Um, yeah, so the, there's different yeah. ways to address that. So I know of some labs, what, what they do is they they will have the, the first study of the PhD would be a registered study. And then as soon as that's submitted, then they move on to preparing the next one. So that when they're waiting, they're working on the next one. Plus, the the the, the time is not wasted because all the effort that goes into um, preparing for the registered report will be useful. That's all the material you would put in the introduction, the general introduction of the of the of the thesis. Also, you might be delaying data acquisition, but you're saving a lot of time potentially afterwards because if you have acceptance in principle, you can carry your research. Then you have, if you've done your job well, you've got all your analysis pipeline ready. So you have your scripts ready. You can just plug in your data, speed out the results. Um, and then the stuff gets published quickly, as opposed to trying to place your article in a high impact factor journal, you get rejected for dubious reasons. Um, and then you go to another one, and then another one, and then some. You, you have some people, I and mean, I have plenty of examples of papers like that that have been going on for over a year, being in, under review. So, you yes, you 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 lose time maybe at the start, but it's not time wasted. You might actually it might be overall faster. I don't know if we have detailed statistics on that, but my impression is that you would have a much smoother ride with a registered report. And it's good training for a PhD student. And of course, I mean, as we discussed in the chat, the, the alternative is you could just, you could start by doing a registration. So you could go on the OSF, and there you can describe ahead of time your um, methodology, your experimental paradigm, um, and then lock that. So you get a DOI, you've got, something you can cite and you include in your submission. Um, the, that means that you, the negative aspect is that you don't get feedback to improve your experiment, but when you submit your paper, you can refer that, uh, you can refer to that document so that when some reviewer asks you to do some plenty of extra analysis, you can just say, well, um, actually, look, uh, we, we, we declared our intention ahead of time. So yes, we can try to do some of them, uh, but I will go into a different section in the paper. And that will be our exploratory section. So I, I don't try to make us change our story to, you know, have a nice narrative to fit the, to fit the new analysis because we, 
we've declared our intentions, so we can change our intention. We can go back in the past. So at least it gives you a lot of those advantages, but you don't get you don't get feedback early on. So this I just want to um, ask uh, a couple of questions just to, to finish that have come through. So um, uh, there's a follow up on the uh, uh, past uh, question on the Explorer of Three report. So um, uh, do you think it would be possible to do an exploratory report for a third year dissertation? And the second question that's come in, if you do exploratory research and you just show the data that you thought shows some interesting differences or effects, but there's no uh, stats to be reported, but does it make sense to still run some stats on uh, some effect that you found through an exploratory way? And by statistics, we're talking about uh, inferential statistics, not just descriptive. It depends what people mean by that. It's uh, um, the, you could run some complex statistical model. It just means that at the end you may not have a p-value and a some threshold to declare that you have a significant effect or not. Um, so depends what people mean by inferential statistics. I mean, you could do exploratory research with using complex uh, mathematical model and describe your data carefully. That's not that's not an issue. I, can't I might have a, a slightly different view to Guillaume. I think that if you publish a paper with exploratory analysis and you can present the data, that's that's all very interesting. But the question is what claims you make from those data in the paper. As soon as you make a claim that this supports a particular hypothesis or theory, then I think you need to do some kind of statistics. Um, and uh, in, I would ideally say then do a second study based on that hypothesis that's confirmatory or based on a registered report, I hypothesis driven. So the question is, what do you want? To, why are you adding statistics? Is it to make a claim about a particular hypothesis? In which case, um, then you have to take out that is a post hoc hypothesis. And uh, uh, statistics therefore have a slightly different meaning. Um, but I think uh, it all depends on what interpretations you put on the uh, in discussion section of a exploratory uh, analysis paper. I mean, there, are like data, there are data papers that you can publish which just describe a data set. Uh, and if Hubert Weasel just described the recordings, it would still have been fantastic. It was, it would have been fantastic for science. It's fantastic just to report data. But I think as soon as you want to make claims, then you need statistics. And I would just add to that that if what you mean by running stats is to get the report, say, p values at the end of that, I wouldn't recommend doing that because I think the meaning of the p-value is kind of gone at that point if you've done lots of data exploration that's kind of the central argument for pre-registration in the first place is that it makes the p-values meaningful it means that they actually have the intended meaning of the probability of observing an effect of that size or greater given the null um, once you've explored the data it's sort of painted if you will for that particular purpose um, and I think that's I think you can really go astray that way. If you do lots of exploring and then you find something and then you do a P, you do a hypothesis test at that point, that's sort of, that is kind of the definition of uh, P hacking or phishing, if you will. Yeah, and you get you get a, you get a lot of that in the so-called uh, pilot studies. So in neuroscience, I quite, as editor, I quite often get sort of, it's pilot study, it's in the title, it says pilot study, so it's got like nine participants. And well, if it's a pilot study, it's exploratory. And uh, there, are, there are different meanings of that, but one of the meaning in clinical research is, is essentially it's a feasibility study. You check that you can run the paradigm on its own patients. But then there shouldn't be any p-values or significant tests at all. Uh, but people mix the two approaches and they use the nickname uh, pilot study to, to, to excuse a low sample size, essentially. Um, but that's, you know, that's the fault of journal editors. We, we should really have editorial boards. We should really work on special formats for this sort of, for this sort of studies. Um, I don't know what you would do with that, you know, with clinicians working on a few patients and they want to report their data. Um, how do you make them report all that stuff? Um, uh, we, you know, without trying to 
declare some vague hypothesis that they that they had beforehand. Most of the time, it's just purely exploratory. But we just don't have the the, the format to let people report that, thinking that you know they'll have a reward at the end, a paper that that be well received or be useful to the community. Or some people would just say we sh just shouldn't have such studies. You know, if you have small sample sizes, just keep it to yourself. We don't want that. Thank you very much. I think that's um, all the time that we've got time for. Um, thank you very much for uh, all of the questions that have come in and um, to Johan, Rick and Guillaume for their presentations and their, their thoughts on, on how to sort of address some of these issues. Um, as I said before, the recording will be up on the BNA website um, and please feel free to um, uh, go to the bna.org.uk and to bnacredibility.org.uk for information on the credibility campaign. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.